Excerpt from Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship and Travels, Volume 3, from Chapter 16, The New Molusina, by Johann Goethe. 1749 to 1832 translated by thomas carlyle in 1842 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org beginning on page 222 my journey proceeded without accident but if i had hitherto paid little heed to the mysteries of my adventure expecting a natural solution of the whole there now occurred something which threw me into astonishment into anxiety nay into fear being wont in my impatience for change of place to hurry forward day and night it was often my hap to be travelling in the dark and when the lamps by any chance went out to be left in utter obscurity once in the dead of such a night i had fallen asleep and on awakening i observed the glimmer of a light on the covering of my carriage i examined this more strictly and found that it was issuing from the box in which there seemed to be a chink as if it had been clapped by the warm and dry weather of summer which was now come on my thoughts of jewels again came into my head i supposed there must be some carbuncle lying in the box and this point i forthwith set about investigating i postured myself as well as might be so that my eye was in immediate contact with the chink and how great was my surprise when a fair apartment well lighted and furnished with much taste and even costliness met my inspection just as if i had been looking down through the opening of a dome into a royal saloon a fire was burning in the grate and before it stood an armchair i held my breath and continued to observe and now there entered from the other side of the apartment a lady with a book in her hand whom i at once recognized for my wife though her figure was contracted into the extreme of diminution she sat down in the chair by the fire to read she trimmed the coals with the most dainty pair of tongs and in the course of her movements i could clearly perceive that this fairest little creature was also in the family way but now i was obliged to shift my constrained posture a little and the next moment when i bent down to look in again and convince myself that it was no dream the light had vanished and my eye rested on empty darkness how amazed nay terrified i was you may easily conceive i started a thousand thoughts on this discovery and in truth could think nothing in the midst of this i fell asleep and on awakening i fancied that it must have been a mere dream yet i felt myself in some degree estranged from my fair one and though i watched over the box but so much the more carefully i knew not whether the event of her reappearance in human size was a thing which i should wish or dread after some time she did in fact reappear one evening in a white robe she came gliding in and as it was just then growing dusky in my room she seemed to me taller when i had seen her last and i remembered having heard that all beings of the mermaid and gnome species increased in stature very perceptibly by the fall of night she flew as usual to my arms but i could not with right gladness press her to my obstructed breast my dearest said she i now feel by thy reception of me what alas i already knew too well thou hast seen me in the interim thou art acquainted with the state in which at certain times i find myself thy happiness and mine is interrupted nay 
it stands on the brink of being annihilated altogether i must leave thee and i know not whether i shall ever see thee again her presence the grace with which she spoke directly banished from my memory almost every trace of that vision which indeed had already hovered before me as little more than a dream i addressed her with kind vivacity convinced her of my passion assured her that i was innocent that my discovery was accidental in short i so managed it that she appeared composed and endeavoured to compose me try thyself strictly said she whether this discovery has not hurt thy love whether thou canst forget that i live in two forms beside thee whether the diminution of my being will not also contract thy affection i looked at her she was fairer than ever and i thought within myself is it so great a misfortune after all to have a wife who from time to time becomes a dwarf so that one can carry her about with him in a casket was it not much worse if she became a giantess and put her husband in the box my gaiety of heart had returned i would not for the whole world have let her go best heart said i let us be and continue ever as we have been could either of us wish to be better enjoy thy conveniency and i promise thee to guard the box with so much the more faithfulness why should the prettiest sight i have ever seen in my life make a bad impression on me how happy would lovers be could they but procure such miniature pictures and after all it was but a picture a little sleight of hand deception thou art trying and teasing me but thou shalt see how i will stand it the matter is more serious than thou thinkest said the fair one however i am truly glad to see thee take it so lightly for much good may still be awaiting us both i will trust in thee and for my own part do my utmost only promise me that thou wilt never mention this discovery by way of reproach another prayer likewise i most earnestly make to thee be more than ever on thy guard against wine and anger i promised what she required i could have gone on promising to all lengths but she herself turned aside the conversation and henceforth all proceeded in its former routine we had no inducement to alter our place of residence the town was large the society various and the fine season gave rise to many an excursion and garden festival in all such amusements the presence of my wife was welcome nay eagerly desired by women as well as men a kind insinuating manner joined with a certain dignity of bearing secured to her on all hands praise and estimation besides she could play beautifully on the lute accompanying it with her voice and no social night could be perfect unless crowned by the graces of this talent i will be free to confess that i have never got much good for music on the contrary it has always rather had a disagreeable effect on me my fair one soon noticed this and accordingly when by ourselves she never tried to entertain me by such means in return however she appeared to indemnify herself while in society where indeed she always found a crowd of admirers and now why should i deny it our late dialogue in spite of my best intentions had by no means sufficed to abolish the matter within me on the contrary my temper of mind had by degrees got into the strangest tune almost without my being conscious of it one night in a large company this hidden grudge broke loose and by its consequences produced to myself the greatest damage when i look back on it now i in fact loved my beauty far less after that unlucky discovery i was also growing jealous of her a whim that had never struck me before 
this night at table i found myself placed very much to my mind beside my two neighbors a couple of ladies who for some time had appeared to me very charming amid jesting and soft small talk i was not sparing of my wine while on the other side a pair of musical dilettanti had got hold of my wife and at last contrived to lead the company into singing separately and by way of chorus this put me into ill humor the two amateurs appeared to me impertinent the singing vexed me and when as my turn came they even requested a solo strophe from me i grew truly indignant i emptied my glass and set it down again with no soft movement the grace of my two fair neighbors soon pacified me indeed but there is an evil nature in wrath when once it is set a-going it went on fermenting within me though all things were of a kind to induce joy and complacence on the contrary i waxed more splenetic than ever when a lute was produced and my fair one began fingering it and singing to the admiration of all the rest unhappily a general silence was requested so then i was not even to talk any more and these tones were going through me like a toothache was it any wonder that at last the smallest spark should blow up the mine the songstress had just ended a song amid the loudest applauses when she looked over to me and this truly with the most loving face in the world unluckily its lovingness could not penetrate so far she perceived that i had just gulped down a cup of wine and was pouring out a fresh one with her right forefinger she beckoned to me in kind threatening consider that it is wine said she not louder than for myself to hear it water is for mermaids cried i my ladies said she to my neighbors crown the cup with all your gracefulness that it not be too often emptied you will not let yourself be tutored whispered one of them in my ear what ails the dwarf cried i with a more violent gesture in which i overset the glass ah what you have spilt cried the paragon of women at the same time twanging her strings as if to lead back the attention of the company from this disturbance to herself her attempt succeeded the more completely as she rose to her feet seemingly that she might play with greater convenience and in this attitude continued preluding at sight of the red wine running over the tablecloth i returned to myself i perceived the great fault i had been guilty of and it cut me through the very heart never till now had music spoken to me the first verse she sang was a friendly good night to the company here as they were as they might still feel themselves together with the next verse they became as if scattered asunder each felt himself solitary separated no one could fancy that he was present any longer but what shall i say of the last verse it was directed to me alone the voice of injured love bidding farewell to moroseness and caprice in silence i conducted her home foreboding no good scarcely however had we reached our chamber when she began to show herself exceedingly kind and graceful nay even roguish she made me the happiest of all men next morning in high spirits and full of love i said to her thou hast so often sung when asked in company as for example thy touching farewell song last night come now for my sake and sing me a dainty gay welcome to this morning hour that we may feel as if we were meeting for the first time that i may not do my friend she said seriously the song of last night referred to our parting which must now forthwith take place for i can only tell thee the violation of thy promise and oath will have the worst consequences for us both thou hast scoffed away a great felicity and i too must renounce my dearest wishes as i now pressed and entreated her to explain herself more clearly she answered 
that alas i can well do for at all events my continuance with thee is over here then what i would rather have concealed to the latest times the form under which thou sawest me in the box is my natural and proper form for i am of the race of king ecwald the dread sovereign of the dwarfs concerning whom authentic history has recorded so much our people are still as of old laborious and busy and therefore easy to govern thou must not fancy that the dwarfs are behindhand in their manufacturing skill swords which followed the foe when thou cast them after him invisible and mysterious binding chains impenetrable shields and such like where in olden times formed their staple produce but now they chiefly employ themselves with articles of convenience and ornament in which truly they surpass all people of the earth i may well say it would astonish thee to walk through our workshops and warehouses all this would be right and good were it not that with the whole nation in general but more particularly with the royal family there is one peculiar circumstance connected she paused for a moment and i again begged farther light on these wonderful secrets which accordingly she forthwith proceeded to grant it is well known said she that god so soon as he had created the world and the ground was dry and the mountains were standing bright and glorious that god i say thereupon in the very first place created the dwarfs to the end that there might be reasonable beings also who in their passages and chasms might contemplate and adore his wonders in the inward parts of the earth it is farther well known that this little race by degrees became uplifted in heart and attempted to acquire the dominion of the earth for which reason god then created the dragons in order to drive back the dwarfs into their mountains now as the dragons themselves were wont to nestle in the large caverns and clefts and dwell there and many of them too were in the habit of spitting fire and working much other mischief the poor little dwarfs were by these means thrown into exceeding straits and distress so that not knowing what in the world to do they humbly and fervently turned to god that he would vouchsafe to abolish this unclean dragon generation but though it consisted not with his wisdom to destroy his own creatures yet the heavy sufferings of the poor dwarf so moved his compassion that anon he created the giants ordained them to fight these dragons and if not root them out at least lessen their numbers now no sooner had the giants got moderately well through with the dragons than their hearts also began to wax wanton and in their presumption they practised much tyranny especially on the good little dwarfs who thence once more in their need turned to the lord and he by the power of his hand created the knights who were to make war on the giants and dragons and to live in concord with the dwarfs hereby was the work of creation completed on this side and it is plain that henceforth giants and dragons as well as knights and dwarfs have always maintained themselves in being from this my friend it will be clear to thee that we are of the oldest race on the earth a circumstance which does us honour but at the same time brings a great disadvantage along with it for as there is nothing in the world that can endure for ever but all that has once been great must become little and fade so it is our lot also that ever since the creation of the world we have been waning and growing smaller especially the royal family on whom by reason of their pure blood this destiny presses with the heaviest force to remedy this evil our wise teachers have many years ago devised the expedient of sending forth a princess of the royal house from time to time into the world to wed some honourable knight so that the dwarf progeny may be reflected and saved from entire decay 
though my fair one related these things with an air of the utmost sincerity i looked at her hesitatingly for it seemed as if she meant to palm some fable on me as to her own dainty lineage i had not the smallest doubt but that she should have laid hold of me in place of a knight occasioned my distrust seeing i knew myself too well to suppose that my ancestors had come into the world by an immediate act of creation i concealed my wonder and scepticism and asked her kindly but tell me my dear child how hast thou attained this large and stately shape for i know few women that in richness of form can compare with thee thou shalt hear replied she it is a settled maxim in the council of the dwarf kings that this extraordinary step be forborne as long as it possibly can which indeed i cannot but say is quite natural and proper perhaps they might have lingered still longer had not my brother born after me come into the world so exceedingly small that the nurses actually lost him out of his swaddling clothes and no creature yet knows whither he is gone on this occurrence unexampled in the annals of dwarfdom the sages were assembled and without more ado the resolution was taken and i set out in quest of a husband the resolution exclaimed i that is all extremely well one can resolve one can take his resolution but to give a dwarf this heavenly shape how did your sages manage that it had been provided for already said she by our ancestors in the royal treasury lay a monstrous gold ring i speak of it as it then appeared to me when i saw it in my childhood for it was this same ring which i have here on my finger we now went to work as follows i was informed of all that awaited me and instructed what i had to do and to forbear a splendid palace after the pattern of my father's favorite summer residence was then got ready a main edifice wings and whatever else you could think of it stood at the entrance of a large rock cleft which it decorated in the handsomest style on the appointed day our court moved thither my parents also and myself the army paraded and four and twenty priests not without difficulty carried on a costly litter the mysterious ring it was placed on the threshold of the building just within the spot where you entered many ceremonies were observed and after a pathetic farewell i proceeded to my task i stepped forward to the ring laid my finger on it and that instant began perceptibly to wax in stature in a few moments i had reached my present size and then i put the ring on my finger but now in the twinkling of an eye the doors windows gates flapped too the wings grew up into the body of the edifice instead of a palace stood a little box beside me which i forthwith lifted and carried off with me not without a pleasant feeling in being so tall and strong still indeed a dwarf to trees and mountain to streams and tracts of land yet a giant to grass and herbs and above all to ants from whom we dwarfs not being always on the best terms with them often suffer considerable annoyance how it fared with me on my pilgrimage i might tell thee at great length suffice it to say i tried many but no one save thou seemed worthy of being honored to renovate and perpetuate the line of the glorious ekwald in the course of these narrations my head had now and then kept wagging without myself having absolutely shaken it i put several questions to which i received no very satisfactory answers on the contrary i learned to my great affliction that after what had happened she must needs return to her parents she had hopes still she said of getting back to me but for the present it was indispensably necessary to present herself at court as otherwise both for her and me there was nothing but utter ruin the purses would soon cease to pay and who knew what all would be the consequences on hearing that our money would run short i inquired no further into consequences i shrugged my shoulders i was silent and she seemed to understand 
we now packed up and got into our carriage the box standing opposite us in which however i could still see no symptoms of a palace in this way we proceeded several stages post money and drink money were readily and richly paid from the pouches to the right and left till at last we reached a mountainous district and no sooner had we alighted here than my fair one walked forward directing me to follow her with the box she led me by rather steep paths to a narrow plot of green ground through which a clear brook now gushed in little falls now ran in quiet windings she pointed to a little knoll bade me to set the box down there then said farewell thou wilt easily find the way back remember me i hope to see thee again at this moment i felt as if i could not leave her she was just now in one of her fine days and if you will her fine hours along with so fair a being on the green sward among grass and flowers girt in by rocks waters murmuring round you what heart could have remained insensible i came forward to seize her hand to clasp her in my arms but she motioned me back threatening me though still kindly enough with great danger if i did not instantly withdraw is there no possibility then exclaimed i of my staying with thee of thy keeping me beside thee these words i uttered with such rueful tones and gestures that she seemed touched by them and after some thought confessed to me that a continuance of our union was not entirely impossible who happier than i my importunity which increased every moment compelled her at last to come out with her scheme and inform me that if i too could resolve on becoming as little as i had once seen her i might still remain with her be admitted to her house her kingdom her family the proposal was not altogether to my mind yet at that moment i positively could not tear myself away so having already for a good while been accustomed to the marvellous and being at all times prone to bold enterprises i closed with her offer and said she might do with me as she pleased i was thereupon directed to hold out the little finger of my right hand she placed her own against it then with her left hand she quite softly pulled the ring from her finger and let it run along mine that instant i felt a violent twinge on my finger the ring shrunk together and tortured me horribly i gave a loud cry and caught round me for my fair one but she had disappeared what state of mind i was in during this moment i find no words to express so i have nothing more to say but that i very soon in my miniature size found myself beside my fair one in a wood of grass stalks the joy of meeting after this short yet strange separation or if you will of this reunion without separation exceeds all conception i fell on her neck she replied to my caresses and the little pair was as happy as the large one with some difficulty we now mounted a hill i say difficulty because the sward had become for us an almost impenetrable forest yet at length we reached a bare space and how surprised was i at perceiving there a large bolted mass which ere long i could not but recognize for the box in the same state as when i had set it down go up to it my friend said she and do but knock with the ring thou shalt see wonders i went up accordingly and no sooner had i rapped than i did in fact witness the greatest wonder two wings came jutting out and at the same time there fell like scales and chips various pieces this way and that while doors windows colonnades and all that belongs to a complete palace at once came into view if ever you have seen one of rotchin's discs how at one pull a multitude of springs and latches get in motion the writing board and writing materials letter and money compartments all at once or in quick succession start forward you will partly conceive how this palace unfolded itself into which my sweet attendant now introduced me 
in the large saloon i directly recognized the fireplace which i had formerly seen from above and the chair in which she had then been sitting and on looking up i actually fancied i could still see something of the chink in the dome through which i had peeped in i spare you the description of the rest in a word all was spacious splendid and tasteful scarcely had i recovered from my astonishment when i heard afar off a sound of military music my better half sprang up and with rapture announced to me the approach of his majesty her father we stepped out to the threshold and here beheld a magnificent procession moving towards us from a considerable cleft in the rock soldiers servants officers of state and glittering courtiers followed in order at last you observed a golden throng and in the midst of it the king himself as soon as the whole procession had drawn up before the palace the king with his nearest retinue stepped forward his loving daughter hastened out to him pulling me along with her we threw ourselves at his feet he raised me graciously and on coming to stand before him i perceived that in this little world i was still the most considerable figure we proceeded together to the palace where his majesty in presence of his whole court was pleased to welcome me with a well-studied oration in which he expressed his surprise at finding us here acknowledged me as his son-in-law and appointed the nuptial ceremony to take place on the morrow a cold sweat went over me as i heard him speak of marriage for i dreaded this even more than music which otherwise appeared to me the most hateful thing on earth your music makers i used to say enjoy at least the conceit of being in unison with each other and working in concord for when they have tweaked and tuned long enough grating our ears with all manners of screeches they believe in their hearts that the matter is now adjusted and one instrument accurately suited to the other the bandmaster himself is in this happy delusion and so they set forth joyfully though still tearing our nerves to pieces in the marriage state even this is not the case for although it is but a duet and you might think two voices or even two instruments might in some degree be attuned to each other yet this happens very seldom for while the man gives out one tone the wife directly takes a higher one and the man again a higher and so it rises from the chamber to the choral pitch and farther and farther till at last wind instruments themselves cannot reach it and now as harmonical music itself is an offence to me it will not be surprising that this harmonical should be a thing which i cannot endure of the festivities in which the day was spent i shall and can say nothing for i paid small heed to any of them the sumptuous victuals the generous wine the royal amusements i could not relish i kept thinking and considering what i was to do here however there was but little to be considered i determined once for all to take myself away and hide somewhere accordingly i succeeded in reaching the chink of a stone where i entrenched and concealed myself as well as might be my first care after this was to get the unhappy ring off my finger an enterprise however which would by no means prosper for on the contrary i felt that every pull i gave the metal grew straighter and cramped me with violent pains which again abated as soon as i desisted from my purpose early in the morning i awoke for my little person had slept and very soundly and was just stepping out to look farther about me when i felt a kind of rain coming down through the grass flowers and leaves there fell as it were something like sand and grit in large quantities but what was my horror when the whole of it became alive and an innumerable host of ants rushed down on me no sooner did they observe me than they made an attack on all sides and though i defended myself stoutly and gallantly enough they at last so hemmed me in so nipped and pinched me that i was glad to hear them calling to surrender 
i surrendered instantly and wholly whereupon an aunt of respectable stature approached me with courtesy nay with reverence and even recommended itself to my good graces i learned that the aunts had now become allies of my father-in-law and by him called out in the present emergency and commission to fetch me back here then was little i in the hands of creatures still less i had nothing for it but looking forward to the marriage nay i must now thank heaven if my father-in-law were not wroth if my fair one had not taken the sullens let me skip over the whole train of ceremonies in a word we were wedded gaily and joyously as matters went there were nevertheless solitary hours in which you were led astray into reflection now there happened to me something which had never happened before what and how you shall learn everything about me was completely adapted to my present form and wants the bottles and glasses were in a fit ratio to a little toper nay if you will better measure in proportion than with us in my tiny palate the dainty tidbits tasted excellently a kiss from the little mouth of my spouse was still the most charming thing in nature and i will not deny that novelty made all these circumstances highly agreeable unhappily however i had forgotten my former situation i felt within me a scale of bygone greatness and it rendered me restless and cheerless now for the first time did i understand what the philosophers might mean by their ideal which they say so plagues the mind of man i had an ideal of myself and often in dreams i appeared as a giant in short my wife my ring my dwarf figure and so many other bonds and restrictions made me utterly unhappy so that i began to think seriously about obtaining my deliverance being persuaded that the whole magic lay in the ring i resolved on filing this asunder from the court jeweler accordingly i borrowed some files by good luck i was left-handed as indeed throughout my whole life i had never done aught in the right-handed way i stood tightly to the work and it was not small for the golden hoop so thin as it appeared had grown proportionably thicker in contracting from its former length all vacant hours i privately applied to this task and at last the metal being nearly through i was provident enough to step out of doors this was a wise measure for all at once the golden hoop started sharply from my finger and my frame shot aloft with such violence that i actually fancied i should dash against the sky and at all events i must have bolted through the dome of our palace nay perhaps in my new awkwardness have destroyed this summer residence altogether but here then was i standing again in truth so much larger but also as it seemed to me so much the more foolish and helpless on recovering from my stupefaction i observed the royal strong-box lying near me which i found to be moderately heavy as i lifted it and carried it down the footpath to the next stage where i directly ordered horses and set forth by the road i soon made trial of the two side pouches instead of money which appeared to be run out i found a little key it belonged to the strong box in which i got some moderate compensation so long as this held out i made use of the carriage by and by i sold it and proceeded by diligence the strong box too i at length cast from me having no hope of its ever filling again and thus in the end after a considerable circuit i again returned to the kitchen hearth to the landlady and the cook where you were first introduced to me end of excerpt from wilhelm meister's apprenticeship and travels volume three by johann goethe translated by thomas carlyle in eighteen forty two